Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Carrie Kersberg, and we're going to be sharing with you how to fire vision care plans on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thanks again for joining us. I'm so excited to have Carrie Ersberg on the uh, podcast with me. Carrie, uh, thanks for joining me. How are you today? I'm great, David. It's great to be here. It's great to talk to my colleagues, you know, to share some time. I always feel it's a special gift that, you know, even as we age in this profession, especially it's been such a great profession. I grew up in the golden age, right? So that was when you just put a shingle out and you made money. But now it's, you know, it, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to my younger colleagues who I've really you know, been yeah. trying to, over my life, kind of been very concerned about and trying to help as far as getting along and, and being as successful as we were, you know, through the through yeah. those golden years. So, well, Carrie, I think most everybody knows who you are and your impact in the myopia world has been, you know, second to very few people. Um, share with us a little bit about who you are and what you've been up to recently, and uh, maybe share a little bit about the academy and so forth as well. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, uh, currently I'm I'm working with Johnson Johnson. I'm one of their PAC speakers, which means that I get to go around and again work with our colleagues, and start teaching them how to use it, their products, and also educating them in ortho K and myopia management, which is a you know big passion of mine. I've been doing that for over forty years now. It's a it's kind of neat to think about it. But back in the early '80s, I was uh, one of the pioneers there with that uh, with that when we were doing that, and it was unheard of. You know, nobody did myopia. I mean, they did myopia, but it wasn't that way. You know, they, they, myopia was a cash cow because it brought patients into your office and you kept giving stronger and stronger prescriptions. I've been basically a, a preventive care practitioner um, from, the, from the beginning. And, and I felt like the, the profession never fit me uh, in that respect. Um, mm. I don't think we have been a preventive care profession. I mean, we spout our beliefs that we, this is what we're supposed to be doing, but you know, in, in action, it doesn't really work that way. So to truly practice preventive care, you have to kind of leave the mold. Uh, you have to kind of carve it out yourself. And back in the 80s, it was even more apparent because uh, they weren't doing it. You know, we, people were, uh, the common thought was that myopia was this thing that, you know, was organic. It was it was something that just happened. The doctor had no nothing to do with it except prescribe stronger lenses. Uh, yeah. Ohio State University was famous for this. That, that kind of model that it was just, you know, determined. I mean, you're genetic and you're going to get my office. Yeah. And it took us a long time. It took us a long time to get rid of that. I mean, there were some really important people that were spouting that. And we were clinicians. I mean, this is a, I'm clinician driven. I mean, this is, you're talking to the people that do the, you know, we do the work for everyone else. And when we finally come up with these things that we're doing, then, then, the, then they do some studies on them. But we as clinicians noticed a long time ago, this couldn't be genetic only. I mean, because we are seeing this, generations of patients that you know didn't have a history of myopia and all of a sudden they were myopic and uh or that they were much more myopic than their parents were at earlier and earlier ages so we knew early on this couldn't be all genetics we knew this yeah. had to be a strong environmental impact and you just even back then i mean i was i was on the first uh, to get a cope approved course on uh, kits and computers back in the year 2000 i used to work for creole corporation also and uh, people would look at me like, kids and computers, what are you talking about? I said, do you talk to your young patients? You know, do you actually discuss with them that they, how, many, how, many, how much time do you spend on computers? Because even back then in the early 2000s, they were doing this. And moms were doing, at six months, they were, their kids were being, uh, you know, they, they yeah. thought it would help learn better, right? And we found out that's yeah. something. Oh, Was this the sort of stimulus that kind of led to you guys creating the academy and 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 yes. what's come about with earth okay how did that kind of come about well before the academy i actually was the president of the national eye research foundation which was founded by newton wesley who's uh most yeah, both an OD and an MD. Mm -hmm. yeah wesley jess and he's probably one of the most famous eye doctors that has ever lived he invent you know he had a patent on the the, the Tui. he and Tui had a patent on the original corneal uh lens so he, yeah. you know, he was my inspiration. I mean, he was a guy with my mentor and he chose me to lead his, in his group. Unfortunately, at the point when I did that, things didn't work out the best for that. Uh, even though I did, I thought I did an incredible job of bringing him into the point where they could actually succeed, but we, it didn't work. So things yeah. like that happened. In life. And uh, 
I ended up going to the global, the first, the GOS, the Global Orthopedology Symposium in right. Toronto. And uh, I was drafted. You know, people uh, said, you know, we want you to lead this group because of the job you did with NERF. So that's how it started uh, back in 2002. And it was, uh, we just, we had our own bylaws, you know, we had canned everything. We didn't have any money. So we had to, you know, do everything with us, with us, with hardly any budget. And we put this group together and uh, it, it, it's been now since you know it's it's going strong. You know, Vision by Design, a, a, a meeting that has is is like a it sets a st- it sets the precedence for everything. And we the, the best speakers come to Vision by Design, the most innovative type of new thinking. I mean, we're competing with major conferences and major funding, <laughs> right? <laughs> or you know, lots of money into these organizations, and we had none of that. We had a mom and pop industry that uh, you know, God bless them, but they that it was a mom and pop industry and that they don't think bigger, you know, they don't think big national, international, all these other things. They think mom and pop. Yeah. So that's what we had to deal with. And, and, you know, eventually we came to the point where we had people like uh, Cooper vision and Perry you know, and Johnson and Johnson, other groups to, you know, Oculus and on and on wave that went on and eventually came, you know, more fit that what we needed as an organization, but yes. So year after year, we threw this, we have membership. Uh, there's amazing things that go on in our Google groups. I mean, people are talking about some things even today about binocular vision issues that most doctors are not even familiar with, you know, what a shame. But, you know, it, if you really want to learn about something, I mean, you really have to apply yourself, right? I mean, it's like, That's right. I remember when I got to school, it was like, you know, I've always been this person who's had to actually work a little bit harder than everyone else to get it done. And my colleagues would say, well, I'm out of school. I don't need to do anything. And I said, no, 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 that isn't how it works. You got to, you know, continue working at it. So yeah, hopefully we get better at this, right? I mean, myopia is up until recently hasn't even been, you know, discussed much in, yeah. except, you know, in schools by management. You know, Kerry, yeah. one thing I've appreciated about you is, is you find ways to make myopia work in practices. And I hear it all the time and you hear it as well as I'm too busy to bring in myopia and I'm too busy given the $50 eye exam to be able to spend that same amount of time to do something else because, you know, I'm doing these eye exams and I'm doing, you know, insurance coverage and so forth. And I think one of the things that you had shared with me at one time is that you, you worked vision insurance out of your practice. Right. Share with them. Yeah. I mean, it just makes sense, right? If you're too busy because you're doing fifty dollar eye exams to bring in myopia management to stop the progression of myopia, you know, you've got some things that you need to rearrange in your head. Share with us a little bit about that yeah. process. You know, Dave, that's a great point. It's your it's the infrastructure that you're talking about here. This the way you do business, you know, that really has to be changed. It's, the vision care plan is not the model, right? So right. what we found was that you know, we we grew to 80% of my practice was, was uh, vision care plans that, that get yeah. grew to, you know, it grows, it does that, it takes over, really. And all your patients are then vision care patients. Even your private pay patients eventually find out you take it. So they say, well, I'm going to use the vision care plan to get it worked. So that's what happened. So we found ourselves then doing, you know, this 80% of practice was vision care plans, but yet it, it only produces a small percentage of our really, our net income. Actually, most of our net income was produced by the other 20%, which was mostly ortho, and myopia control management types of things and scleral lenses. So uh, it became a process of deciding of, you know, what, um, what do you do with that? You know, do you want to continue this vision care path, which as you can see, it's not leading anywhere, or do mm-hmm. you want to take another path, you know, the road less traveled that actually can, can be something. The other thing was that I, w- I, I am a, pre- again, a preventive care practitioner. I can't get an exam done in 10 minutes. I mean, no matter what, it doesn't happen. I mean, how do you do preventive care? At, you know, and if that's talking to your patients, seeing them for a while. I mean, you know. Yeah. So it, it, the model didn't work, and I think that's part of what we're talking about today. With that, uh, you know, with how mm-hmm. do you incorporate myopia management to a to a busy vision care plan practice? And it's it's not you don't <laughs> you, you can't do it. It's not going to happen. You're going to be very frustrated. No. You're going to spin your wheels. You have to basically start you know thinking of something else thinking out of the box and how that's going to work you know with your practice it's a lot like the medical model actually we've been able to draft that out of this you know you have to kind of think along those lines too you're going to it's especially care you know it's, yeah and and for us we grew this into uh um, the complete practice i mean uh my practice was over 90 percent ortho k mm. you know and then and most of the rest of it was myopia management and then there was a section of sclerals you know at the time too so yeah, that's uh, that's incredible. Yeah. So your orthokeratology practice, 
kind of helped you direct yourself. So walk us through that that path from the yeah. day you decided to the day you shared it with your staff and how you actually went from vision coverage for the patients that were walking in the door to the we don't take your insurance anymore. Walk us through some of the steps that you yeah. took to kind of get there. Well, first of all, I think it would be remiss if we didn't mention the fact that back in 1995, Tom Ream had that first four curve. Samuel Hodge, Samuel yeah. Bianca, if I mentioned his name too here. Sammy did, you know, he's got the patent on it. So, I mean, the four curve was basically the development that allowed us to break through because that was the first time you could do a four doctor myo, at least overnight. Up until yeah. that point, we were we were doing multiple pairs of lenses to get even two doctors of myopia, which was you know about the limit of it. So that was really the breakthrough for me at that point, set this whole thing up. But really, the the, the thing that you have to kind of make your you know you put your time in, right? I mean, I hear these doctors have these vision, you know, what they do with these vision care plans. And my first suggestion to them is to carve out spare time in your practice where you don't take vision care. I mean, sure. Take a day where you're just going to take private pay patients. And yeah, maybe you'll be lonely the first time you do that and maybe the first couple of times, but you can then start to build that space you need in your practice to carve, to, to develop a uh, private pay patient. But we did a lot of that. I did, um, you know, I would take these patients and then we would go after them actively. There were ways that you could recruit your ortho K patients. Uh, uh, a lot of Chinese patients are ortho K patients, a lot of Asian patients. So they have communities that you can appeal to that we actually went and did that. We took time off. We, instead of, you know, being in the office, we went and, and actually recruited these patients to do our practice. We went and did mm -hmm. education to, to that, for that fact. And the other part of it was that, you know, I spent an enormous amount of time traveling around the country, uh, spending time with doctors, you know, that basically colleagues and overseas, eventually that led into the overseas thing too. But the idea is that you, you need to um, take the time away from the other thing. If you just do nothing but vision care plans all day, it's not happening. You, you need to really decide how you want this, you know, to happen for you. And then you have to make it so, you know. But, but eventually what we got to was at that point, and fortunately for us, because I had 20% of my practice was uh, ortho K and such, I was able to cut out the, you know, the vision care at that point. We dropped everything. Within about a year, everything was gone. And sure, it took us about three years to get back to that level again, but our net never really affected the same way as our gross did. Our gross came way, way down, but the net stayed pretty firm because the, you know we had that base to work with. So, so yeah. talking to my colleagues here, you can't even think about doing this unless you have this private part of your practice growing enough that it can take over. So, you, you know, otherwise you're going to, you know, it's not working for you. So you have to really kind of build that ahead of time. Yeah. So let me... Let me uh, pound into that a little bit. So as you decreased substantially the revenue that you were making from your vision care plan, mm -hmm. you were able to see fewer patients. Right. You added patients, Much but there wasn't as many. But from those patients, the revenue was high enough that you really didn't feel um, anything in your pocketbook. Your, your practice is total gross shifted, but the amount right. that actually went into the bank stayed about the same. Yeah. So after about in the first year or so, it did get affected a bit, but not to the point where, you know, you couldn't survive on it. But after it took us about three years to get to get that model back to where we, you know, we wanted to. And the other thing that happens too, is that it facilitated the growth of my uh, myopia management practice, because I was able to then use the extra time to take the, you know, to get these patients. There's, when you do ortho care and myopia management, there's, a, there's more follow-up. You know, it's not your typical soft lens fitting. You have to do follow up. You have to do AL measurements. You have to do other things. So we had to have that space in there. You know, those kinds of things: the uh, slit lamp examinations, the follow ups, the topographies, everything else that happens with a with a specialty care practice. And so having the space there, we could do that. And and I, yeah, I I, I spent a lot more time with my patients. I would recruit them uh, because I could talk to them with moms. I'd get the you know. I'd, have them bring in their kids because they were yeah. near side. You could be checked early. Right. And then they bring their families in after a while, because it was like, you know, something that we were able to pr promote much more of that because we had the time, you know, right. and, and you can't discount the fact that your staff, as you mentioned earlier, the staff has to be on board with this and, and ready for that too. And, you know, the easiest way to do that is to 
take a couple of those staff members and do ortho K on them or something else that's really impressive. And they'll start talking about it to your patient. So, yeah. so you want to do a lot of that promotion, of course, attending conferences and like vision by design and the GSLS and things like that, that are important for especially eye care. Uh, Those are great things to do with all the time that you now have. That's right. You do have the time. You're going to live more like a human being, you know, it's uh, not like you're running after your tail all the time, which is the feeling getting a vision care practice. Yeah. Well, as I think you and I both would agree, this this race to see more patients in order to generate the same amount of revenue that we created before is just mind bending. You know, what we used to be able to do with two patients an hour, now it's four patients an hour and the insurance companies are are not telling me that I'm getting a raise. And uh, no. so, <laughs> so let's say they these, did that. I think, they're, these, I think they're paying less than when I left, when I left them in, in the early 2000s. Yeah. yeah. And so an important metric that I really think is important for people to pay attention to, not because you're trying to gouge each patient, but is the the revenue per encounter that you're making. And that revenue per encounter can kind of guide you as to be like, okay, if we need to make this much do- this many dollars per day in order to hit our monthly or our yearly target, that really nails down for you how many encounters you need to see on a daily basis. And if if your revenue per encounter is making it so you're having to see way more patients. You need to find additional things that you can do within that half hour, hour, or whatever it is to generate more revenue. And if if you don't do myopia management, you need to sell more glasses. You need to sell more vitamins. You need to sell all that stuff. Yeah, Myopia management is a fantastic way to do it because we're doing preventative medicine in addition to providing a service that is so valuable. And even if we didn't do myopia management to slow down the progression of myopia, and uh, excuse me, if we didn't do ortho K to slow down myopia, if we're just doing it because it's an incredible service, these patients would happily pay for you know the higher dollar amount just to be free from glasses during the day and contact lenses during the day. They're just going to pay more money for oh my that God. anyway. You know, where where else do you hear for myopia? Right? Yeah. Where else do you hear, David? The, 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 this is from an eight year old. This is life changing. <laughs> when else, you know, really seriously, we hear it all the time. But when do you ever yeah. hear that? I mean, it is for them. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you know, I, I, you know, I, I wonder if people really realize it because basically you have to be a you're doing peds, right? This is pediatric work. And so you have to want to see kids. That's a private yeah. program. You know, if you don't see kids or, or you don't like seeing kids, that's a problem because yeah. this is, you know, working with kids. But the other thing is, what are the, I always felt like my biggest responsibility was to leave the kids better off than when I, 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 I saw them. And, and also with the parents, you're talking about a myopic child, to, to take that worry that these parents have, they, there's a lot of it. And to take that off their shoulders, I would always tell my parents of the kids. And these were progressive miles. My God, these kids were like eight years old in the chair, higher prescription than their parents were who were sitting right. there watching the exam, right? And their yeah. parents' parents, their grandparents were, you know, sometimes farmers in China that didn't have a, you know, were hyperopic. You know, I checked them. So, yeah. you know, they had concerns. Where's my child going with this? You know, it's scary. And so one of the best things I could do for them was said, you know what, you're with me now. Let me worry about that. If I think it's a problem, it's going to be a problem. I'll let you know. In yeah. the meantime, you can let that go. And that's a huge benefit you can give to these people that it's such a blessing for them. But I think you're right in one re- in another respect too. You have to think bigger with this thing. You can't think vision care plan kind of thinking. You're doing something, work with patients that's unique and, and, and unusual even today. And that has very it has value to it. The same way someone would go into an orthodontist, you know, and want to get their teeth straight. And it's even you think, okay, that's something, right? That's a that's a benefit. It's good. They're going to look better. They're going to feel better about themselves, about their appearance. But this is like more than that, and and that included. So please, by all means, get over that vision care thinking. Start charging for services like we should be charged. You can't compare it to the vision care model that you don't get paid. I mean, they're not yeah. paying you. I mean, you go. You went to this debt getting out of school. How do you repay that? You know, yeah. with making forty dollars for an eye exam from a vision care plan. Yeah, I think an important component of this as well, Carrie, and hope maybe you can speak to this is. You know, some people might see, well, you're being pretentious. You're you're not wanting to see people because they're not, you know, able to 
to pay you as much money. And, you know, I think the, the analogy there is, you know, I, I serve steak dinner and, um, and I, I just don't want to do hamburgers all day long. And the reality is when we're doing these other services, there's services that are of a higher value. And there is a hamburger joint next door that does a great job. And I, it's not that I don't want to see these patients. It's just that I provide a service that is a, a different level of service with a different outcome than just a standard eye exam. And so that's a direction that I want to move. How did you communicate that to the patients when you dropped their insurance? How did you, how did you share with the patient well, as I'm dropping your insurance? And how do you deal mm. with this aspect of, hey, you're, you're really pretentious, Dr. Richburg? Well, you have to realize, first off, that, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Perhaps. But anyway, uh, you have to think about this in a different way. I mean, yeah. the patients come into your office thinking Hugo's and Buick's, and you're, you're thinking Lexus. But the other thing you think about, too, on a, on a scale is orth- myopia management, ortho K long term, is not that expensive. If you work your rep- this right in your practice, the first year or so, with the initial fees that you're going to set, like anything else, you're going to do most of your work. You know, hopefully, you have a contract with your patients. That's going to be the most expensive part. After that, when they renew this con- contracts like annuities every year, and you replace lenses every year, it's not, you know, compare, they're not. It compares very similarly to what they're paying for, like a routine soft lens that they're replacing, throwing away every day. So it's really not. In fact, ortho K, in, in one respect, I don't. I'm, I like all aspects of my open so I don't want to overemphasize it. But it has so much more value now because... You know, some of the, the, the things we use for even myopia management are more expensive than to the doctor, you know. So you can actually make that model work even more successfully than when I first was in it because that was like, you know, what did you have to compare it with, right? Scleros were the same way. You know, how did we get to scleros fee, proper fees, right? It was the same thing. Right. We had to de- define that because people had the same problems with scleros as far as pricing it properly until they finally got the idea of what their value was, what they actually, you know, their services were worth. Yeah. So I don't, don't look at it that way. My patients will come in actually. And if I can tell them what I'm really doing, they'll come and find ways to pay for that. It's not a problem. They, it, yeah. you know, whatever walk of life they come from, they'll find ways to pay for that service. They will. They yeah. will. So how did you get rid of all of these patients? How did you, because some of them called up and were like, you know, why, why did you drop my insurance? What was your communication with them? Well, we, like, we offered them, you know, we, we made, we offered them uh, discounts on their glasses, right? Yes, they'd have to pay for the full exam fee, but we offered them discounts on their glasses. We brought in other services like Optos and other things to make our exam even better. Mm-hmm. You know, we brought in all the latest technologies that, you know, could, could do that for us to, to show them that they were actually getting, you know, this more value for the services. We, we offered to bring them back. It was really surprising because some of the patients that came back were ones we didn't expect with. And other ones that left were ones we thought would never leave. I had a patient who was referred from my doctor, uh, my dad, who's a, who had practiced uh, 50 years in the practice. He was close to 50 years of practice. And great. my grandfather was also a eye doctor. But he referred patients to me. Those patients came, he delivered them to me for care after he was, you know, leaving the practice, you know, retiring. Those patients left me <laughs> because they could save some more money with their vision player plans. These are people that I did. You know, I did special things for them. We came to their house. I did whatever it was, you know, because they were like family. These people left. But people that were just came to me briefly for the first visits or so stayed. You know, it was amazing to kind of try to predict who was going to stay and who was going to leave. So we made very much of an effort to try to keep these patients. But it, you got to realize this is not your, they take them, the, the vision care plan owns these patients practically. They're, they make it look like every doctor does the same thing. Your exam is the same as my colleagues. Everyone else does the same exam. So what does it matter who you go to, right? You go to anybody. It's going to be the same thing. We're all Melbatos. We're all vanilla. Mm -hmm. We're not. And when we, you know, one of the things you have as a challenge is to define that, you know, in your practice because you said, I do something completely different. Well, if you're doing myopia management, I I got close to you. You're doing something completely different, even today with uh, our colleagues who haven't grasped this yet. So, yes, make yourself different. My, my, My mentor, Newton Wesley, said, Make yourself a legend, you know, by doing, by taking, you know, doing the different stuff. I like right? that. Make yourself yeah. a legend. Yeah. Yes. Well, you happened. certainly, 
you certainly have made yourself a legend for sure. I, I, you know, I think you look back, we can look, those of us who are on this side of things can look at your career and say, you've done an incredible job of creating a path of what legend looks like. So I thank you for where you're at. Right. And, uh, and thanks a lot for hanging out with me on the podcast, the fantastic is, message. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. Anytime I can, you know, carry that message to our colleagues and offer them, uh, you know, hope and, and that there is some kind of other future than getting burnout. This is what we hear now. It's not just ODs. I got physician friends of mine, neighbors that are burning out in their forties. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, you know, here I am, you know, now in my seventies and it's still that enthusiastic about what I'm doing yeah. um, because we're doing what we love and we're doing it the right way. Not the yeah. way that you know, forcing us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like, and subscribe, please share this episode or a previous episode with a friend. And so that they can become a listener of the Myopia podcast as well. Stay tuned for other great episodes in the near future. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.